Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. What we're going to do is we'll go around this way. Um, we have microphones all over the, um, the hall. Uh, I can't actually see everything, but um, let's start this way if you would like to. Yes, go on. Hello, Professor Chomsky. I am perturbed by two questions of moral philosophy. The first one is concerning Peter Singer. Is he right on animal rights? And my second question is on inequities at birth. We can't redistribute IQ, height, good looks, talent. We can redistribute wealth and income. Does this have any moral significance at all? Thank you. Uh, just out of, um, this? I think. Oh. Well, just out of curiosity, uh, uh, do you kill insects? Like mosquitoes when they're bothering you? Or do you think that uh, when mosquitoes are carrying malaria, uh, we ought to develop uh, uh, means to kill them off? Well, question. OK, that's part of the answer. You can pursue. Sure, animals should have rights. But uh, none of us believe that animal, including Peter Singer, that uh, animals should have the rights of human beings. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, the rights don't exist in a vacuum if you're talking about moral philosophy. The rights are associated with responsibilities. Uh, we don't attribute any responsibilities at all to other uh, uh, animals, do we? I mean, we don't say that a, a lion has to be sent to the gas chamber if it kills a gazelle, let's say. No, they don't have responsibilities. And that, of course, if in moral philosophy, now just abstract discussion, uh, relates to the question of what their rights are. And uh, you can, I mean, they should have rights. So for example, it's a step forward in our general uh, kind of moral development that uh, uh, animals are not uh, subjected to uh, torture in the way they were just a few years ago. So in Britain and the United States, they're and now constraints on uh, the torture, what we call experiment, torture of uh, uh, at least animals that are closer to us, like primates, uh, than there were 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so yes, we're developing some sort of conception of uh, rights, but I don't think anyone thinks that animals have the rights and responsibilities of human beings. Uh, okay, then we can enter into the details. Uh, what was the second question? What was the second question? Oh, yeah, Is about it, IQ. No, not uh, about, about general gifts that we are born with. OK, I mean, like, you know, the, somebody asked me to, before to sign uh, uh, a picture and told me that she had only once before asked someone to sign a picture, some tennis champion. OK, well, I'm never going to be a tennis champion, so. Uh, <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm not sorry that he has those talents, which I don't have. I mean, I'm not sorry that uh, people can play the violin in ways I can't dream of, or and so on. I think that's great. Otherwise, it'd be an extremely boring world. So yes, people have all sorts of uh, qualities and capacities. I think you mentioned IQ. That's one of the least significant of them. I mean, whatever it is, it's some very marginal phenomenon. But, uh, it's, uh, Okay. Anyone on that side? But there are real ones, and I think it's great. Sure, there should be a very complex world in which people can do different things, and we can admire and enjoy what they do. Okay. Do you want to go here, since there's no one there? Thank you. Um, Professor Chomsky, this is um, Amesh Amiaza from Ceasefire magazine. Uh, we did an interview with you in the spring of 2011, as the uh, revolutions were sweeping the Arab world. And at the time, um, when I asked you about Syria, the picture was not very clear. And I was wondering, two years now down the line, what your thoughts were on the situation there. And if I could be allowed a second minor question. Prospect magazine um, runs a poll of the greatest intellectual in the world. And for the first two, Polls, I think I'm sure you're familiar with, 10 years ago and five years ago, you were either the top 
uh, intellectual or uh, number two, I think, based on popular votes. This year, they've asked a number of people, including peop you know, such luminaries as Bernard-Henri Lévy and, and so on, to um, pick a, a short list of 65 on which you do not appear. And I was wondering whether you had any comments on that. I didn't have any comments when the first one appeared because it's a joke and don't have any comments on the later ones. Although well, there were some interesting reactions to the first one. Uh, one of the main columnists for the Financial Times, uh, Gideon Rachman, I think his name is, uh, wrote a blog in which he said, we have to organize people to make sure to prevent me from getting on the list next time. I thought that was amusing, but uh, if there's any other interest in it, I don't know what it is, it's a joke. Uh, as far as Syria is concerned, I mean, it's a tragedy. The country's mo moving towards some sort of suicide. Uh, as to what we ought to do, I, I think you ought to turn around and ask him. Uh, I'd suggest reading Patrick Coburn's column in uh, The Independent yesterday. I think that's about right. Uh, arming the factions is just going to make it worse. Uh, every, as far as I know, almost just about everyone who knows anything about Syria and who cares about it pretty much agrees on this. Uh, I don't know that much, but uh, in fact, only what I read. But uh, it seems to be a pretty general understanding that the only hope is some kind of move toward negotiations and diplomacy, which will settle a conflict which otherwise is simply going to destroy the society. And there are proposals, uh, like Dr. Brahimi's proposals, uh, which you know, to, to implement them is not going to be easy. They certainly can't be implemented if nobody supports them. As far as I know, the only countries that support them are Russia and Iran, Iraq maybe. Well, we should ask ourselves, should we be supporting them? I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, number two there. Um, does the anti-Zionist left risk undermining itself if it doesn't also highlight Hamas's abuses of its own people, including violent crackdowns on supposed Western decadence and the recent banning of women from the Gaza Marathon? So you're asking whether Hamas is harming the Palestinian cause? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not a great admirer of Hamas by any means. I, when I was in Gaza, I met uh, Ismail Haniya. We talked about some of these things. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Islamic movements in general I think have very, many very negative aspects like uh, religious-based movements everywhere. I mean, I think uh, to take something that's closer to my direct interest, the enormous and growing power of the Christian right, fundamentalist Christian right in the United States is, I think, uh, not only a danger to the country, but to the world uh, because of U.S. power. And it's a striking phenomenon. It actually revealed itself in the Hegel hearings. It wasn't much commented on, but I'm sure you followed those hearings. But uh, uh, Jewish money and uh, Jewish votes overwhelmingly go to Democrats. Okay? But the Democrats defended Hegel. Uh, the Republicans denounced him. Uh, why? Well, I think a lot of it is appealing to their, to their popular base. Uh, extremist Christian fundamentalists who have a theology that uh, says uh, we have to have a war in the Middle East, uh, end up in Armageddon, everybody slaughters each other, uh, the souls that have been saved rise to heaven, everybody else goes to eternal perdition, uh, that incidentally includes all Jews except for some reason 144,000 who discover Christ in time and they're saved. Well, in order to bring this about, you have to have a war. So therefore you have to support, uh, you have to blow up the Temple Mount, you know, you have to, and it goes on and on like this. Um, just today, uh, today, this morning's paper, uh, one of their uh, uh, great heroes, uh, Rand Paul, probably be a presidential candidate, uh, announced legislation to uh, declare a fertilized cell a person. 
Okay, that means that a fertilized cell uh, can't, is, uh, has all the rights of a person. Can't, can't be killed, so no abortion, for example. Well, those are the kinds of policies that will indeed be implemented as these groups become more powerful. And uh, they're becoming more powerful for a pretty simple reason. If you take a look at American politics, the, the Republican Party over the last couple of decades has pretty much abandoned the pretense of being, being a normal parliamentary party. They're in lockstep service to the extremely rich and to the corporate sector. And you can't get votes that way. So what they've had to do is mobilize sectors of the population that have always been there. It's in many ways a very strange society. They've always been there, uh, religious extremists, uh, nativists, uh, so Rand Paul again uh, is organizing a campaign to oppose the uh, UN's arms control treaty. Uh, arms, you know, exported arms are killing uh, who knows how many people throughout the world. In Mexico, you know, like 60,000 in the last couple of years, huge numbers elsewhere. But we have to oppose it because the U UN arms control treaty is a plot by the United Nations and abetted by the extremists, uh, Obama and Clinton, to try to take away our arms so then the UN can attack us and eliminate our sovereignty. You think that's a small thing? It's not. Uh, you look at the gun, con the gun lunacy in the United States. A lot of it is driven by the fear that we have to have guns to protect ourselves from the government and from the United Nations and other forces that are about to take us over. Well, this is really important. I could go on. This is really important. Uh, you know, what's, what Hamas is doing, I think, is very bad, but this is incomparably worse. It's next to, yeah, and then Gada. Um, Professor Chomsky, do you think Israel will exist in 50 years' time? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I visited uh, Israel during the first intifada, and uh, an old friend of mine, Israeli, uh, uh, a very dovish Israeli, uh, asked me the same question. Uh, do you think Israel will exist in 50 years? And uh, I feel and felt what I've been writing for the last 50 years or so, that Israel's following policies, which maximize its security threats, and they're doing it for good reasons. A lot of, a lot of states do this. Security is not a... Um, is not a high priority for governments. I mean, you can see it right here, England. Like when the, if you followed the Chilcot hearings, the, you know, reviewing the Iraq war, the, uh, the head of, former head of uh, MI5 uh, testified that, uh, what we more or less knew, that uh, when the US and Britain decided to invade Iraq, uh, they did it on the assumption that it would considerably increase terrorism. Well, actually it did way more than was anticipated, about sevenfold in the first year, according to US government statistics. But it's just not an interest. Governments are not all that interested in protecting their citizens from terror and destruction. There's many cases like this. Uh, some of them are totally horrendous. We've just passed the 50th anniversary of uh, the worst moment in human history, uh, the Cu Cuban Missile Crisis, when. I go through the details, uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy was willing to face what he considered a third to a half probability of what would have been a ter terminal nuclear war in order to establish the principle that we're allowed to have missiles surrounding Russia, including in Turkey, actually obsolete missiles which are being removed in favor of more powerful ones. We're entitled to have that. We're entitled to have recently emplaced missiles on Okinawa facing China, but nobody else is allowed to have missiles anywhere outside their territory. That was the principle. Um, it's covered up in various ways, but it's hard to think of a worse moment than that. And that's illustrative of the way states think about the security of their own uh, population. So in the case of Israel, I don't think they're breaking any uh, you know, making, breaking any precedents when uh, 
they follow policies which uh, uh, choose expansion over security. And sometimes it's very explicit. So I think one of the most fateful moments in Israel's history was in 1971, when President Sadat of Egypt uh, offered Israel a full peace treaty, a uh, full peace treaty, uh, offering nothing to the Palestinians, incidentally, uh, in return for Israeli withdrawal from Egyptian territory. Well, you know, for Israeli security, that would have been uh, a, quite a step forward. But they preferred uh, to pursue the plans for rapid expansion of settlements into the Sinai. And they were backed by Henry Kissinger. You can always count on him to take the position that will be the most harmful to human beings. He rarely missed. But uh, so yes, I think, and that's consistent ever since. Like a lot of other states, they're following policies which uh, lead to their moral deg degradation, their isolation, their delegitimation, as they call it now, and uh, very likely ultimate destruction. That's not impossible. Haifa? Thank you for an absolutely wonderful lecture, Professor Chomsky. Um, I want to ask you to speculate about how you see the future for the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. In particular, I'm thinking of the two-state, one-state debate, uh, and wondering where you stand on that. Um, as somebody who's observed this for so many years, your opinion is extremely valuable and important, I think, for this audience and many other people. Well, right now, if we're realistic about it, there are two options. What's discussed almost universally Israelis, Palestinians, others, is uh, two states or one state. But those are not the two options. The two options are two states or Israel and the US continue doing exactly what they're doing right now. Those are the two options. Uh, and I won't run through what they're doing right now, but you can, I'm sure you know, you can go through the details. They're basically systematically continuing to separate Gaza from the West Bank, turning, keeping Gaza as a kind of a prison, uh, uh, imprisoning what remains of the West Bank in the way I described, and taking over probably maybe 40% of, uh, of the land, anything that's valuable. Now that's what's happening before our eyes, and that's the alternative, and it's backed by, strongly backed by the United States, and uh, pretty much backed by Britain and other European countries, whatever their rhetoric. Uh, that's the likely policy if there isn't a two-state settlement. Now, what about one state, or what, in my view, more reasonable days used to be called a binational state, because it will be a binational state? Uh, personally, uh, all my life, I've supported that, uh, back to the 1940s when I was what was then called a Zionist youth activist opposed to a Jewish state. That was part of the Zionist movement at the time. Uh, so yeah, I thought the Jewish state's a really bad idea, and groups I were with, kind of left groups, were looking for Arab-Jewish working-class cooperation to lead to a binational state. Uh, well, if we're interested in this, and we want not just to talk about it, but to try to reach it, which I assume we should, but then we have to answer a question. How do you get from here to there? Okay, you know, everybody can be in favor of, say, uh, eliminating uh, nuclear weapons, but it doesn't help very much to say it. I have to say, how do we get there? You know, all right, so take this question, how do we get there? Uh, Pre-1948, there was a straightforward answer. You just move immediately towards establishing that. And there were prospects, I think. Uh, from 49 up till about 67, there were essentially no prospects. From 67 to the mid-70s, there were, again, prospects. I wrote about it a lot at the time. Uh, it would have been possible, and there was actually some support for this in Israeli military intelligence and some parts of the Palestinian movement for uh, 
moving towards some kind of federation uh, which could lead to closer integration and so on. Well, uh, it, uh, nobody was interested, so it died. By, not, by the mid-70s, uh, that option was gone uh, uh, because Palestinian national rights had entered the international agenda. Before that, in the international agenda, Palestinians were refugees, you know, so nothing about Palestinian national rights. Uh, once they entered the international agenda and the policy of, you know, of most of the world outside the U.S. became to move towards a two-state settlement, uh, then there was a new option. Uh, the first proposal for a two-state settlement, incidentally, was in January 1976, formal proposal, when the major, three major Arab states, uh, Syria, Egypt, and Jordan, so-called confrontation states, brought a resolution to the Security Council uh, calling for establishment of two states on the internationally recognized border, uh, with, um, and the wording was taken from UN 242, there were guarantees for the right of every state, Israel and New Palestinian state, to exist in peace and security with secure and recognized borders. That's, that's basically the international consensus now. Uh, the U.S. vetoed it. Okay, again in 1980, I won't run through the rest of the record, but uh, uh, since that time, the U.S. with the quiet support of its allies, like Britain, uh, has been undermining it. Well, you know, um, if it was realized, and I don't think it's beyond realization, uh, then there could be further moves. Uh, in, uh, every time in the past when tensions have been somewhat reduced, you know, cycle of violence has been reduced, you very quickly see interactions across the borders. I mean, anyone who's ever been in the former Palestine knows you just can't draw a border through it. I mean, any border you draw is totally crazy. Uh, so what happens is uh, people start uh, commercial interactions, cultural exchanges, and so on. Now, that could lead to closer integration and maybe to some kind of federation and then maybe on. Incidentally, I don't think that that should be the final goal that we should be thinking about. Actually, I'll just tell you a personal anecdote. And my first visit to Le Lebanon, which was inadvertent, uh, was in 1953. And my wife and I were students, and uh, we were backpacking up in northern Israel. And uh, by accident, we happened to walk into Lebanon. Uh, there's no meaningful border, you know, like every other border in the world, it's just something arbitrarily imposed by imperial violence. No reason to worship it. A uh, jeep came by and a guy yelled at us, we're in the wrong country, we should come back. <laughs> so we came back. But, uh, you know, I, I would think that if, if you can reach some kind of binational settlement, the next stage ought to be uh, eroding the imperial borders, not just there, in a lot of places. I think that would be very healthy. And frankly, I think, realistically, that's the only framework in which I think there's likely to be some meaningful approach to the huge Palestinian refugee problem could be. In. So that's a possibility. I mean, if there are other options, I'd like to hear them. I've just never heard anything else except I'd like this. Well, okay, there are a lot of things we'd like, but how do you get there? You are upstairs, uh, number five, please. What? Get you some water? Uh, I have some over here. Hello, Professor Chomsky. Uh, we queued outside to hear your lecture today, and I'm so glad we managed to come in. I was born in Mexico City, and my best friends uh, in my building and in my colonia or borough um, were from the Jewish religion. When my mother was growing up, she went to a nun school, but her best friends in her borough, in El Zocalo, were Syrian Lebanese. When I grew up, the best friends I had were the sons and daughters of those who had flown from Franco. And when I became an adult, my best friends were 
the sons and daughters of Chileans who had run away from Allende. <laughs> Allende or from Pinochet? I mean, from Pinochet, yeah. and, and, the, and the ones who had uh, refuged themselves from yeah. the Allende camp. Sorry. Um, and I'm talking of very senior people in Mexico. Um, so you spoke of Latin America with two fronts, the one with hope and the one which is trying to maybe make business with the uranium for with. Iran. Could you uh, tell a Latin American what to expect of her homeland and whether there is a seed of hope there with all these tolerance, like the Londoners who are gathered here tonight? Yeah, well, I mean, Mexico is, is that very much as you described. It's, it's been a center for refugee flow. Uh, remember then, you know, we're all, everyone uh, knows everything about uh, the horrors of Eastern Europe. You know, anyone can reel off the European dissidents who were badly treated and so on. Uh, like say, Václav Havel, who was put in prison for a while, you know, not nice. But I, just as an experiment, how many of you can even know the names of the leading Latin American intellectuals, Jesuit priests, who had their brains blown out in 1989 by a US-run state terrorist force, which had already killed thousands of people and had just returned from uh, renewed training at the John F. Kennedy School of Special Warfare. Uh, just the last, you know, the, la the end, not even end, but uh, of a major war against the church that the United States was conducting after Vatican II, which is much in the news now because Vatican II uh, introduced a heresy. Uh, the heresy was to go back to the Gospels, and uh, uh, in other words, to what the church was before the Romans took it as a, you know, the church of the empire. And uh, Vatican II called for a return to the Gospels, you know, radical pacifist message, uh, preferential option for the poor. It was taken seriously in Latin America, as I'm sure you know. Uh, priests and uh, nuns, uh, lay people, went out into the villages and organized base communities, had people read the Gospels, think about how to take control of their own lives. Uh, I mean, that's a in, totally intolerable heresy. I mean, the Vatican played its role in crushing it, but the U.S. just went to war. And it's not a secret. The uh, famous School of the Americas, which uh, trains Latin American killers, uh, one of their talking points, you know, advertising points, is that the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology. The liberation theology was the effort to bring the Gospels back to the church. And it was a very bloody campaign. Of course, most of the people killed were, you know, peasants, uh, working people, the usual victims. But there was a long strain of religious martyrs, like those I mentioned, and plenty of others. But nobody here knows them. I mean, you know, maybe some of you, maybe you know them, but very few people could even mention their names. And the, the crimes in Latin America through the, say, from 1960 to up to now are far worse than what was going on in Eastern Europe during the same years. But we only know the others uh, because somebody else was committing the crime. So we're we're supposed to know about them and deplore them and so on and so forth, not the ones we're killing. Well, uh, is there a way to overcome this? Yeah, there is, and I think it's going on in Latin America. The development that I mentioned in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I think is of really historic importance in overcoming this legacy. And it's not just the last 60 years. Uh, after all, this is the first time in half a millennium since the conquistadors, that uh, Latin America has begun to free itself from uh, imperial control. And the, the changes are dramatic. What I mentioned about globalizing torture is one case, but many others. I mean, a long way to go, but uh, it's, I think it's pretty hopeful. One of the most hopeful issues, things in the world. As for the uranium, I, I don't think that amounts to very much. I don't, Latin America doesn't provide uranium. You know. I'm just going to have to take two more questions only, I'm afraid, because we're running out of time. Can we take number three?
Hi, Noam. <clears throat> I want to ask a question about the effectiveness of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement with relation to Israel. <clears throat> I'm part of an organization called Football Beyond Borders, and we're campaigning to get the upcoming UEFA Under-21 football tournament moved away from Israel, um, or if that fails, to mobilize a massive boycott of the tournament. Do you think these kinds of boycotts are effective, and can they have the same global impact as the sports boycotts against apartheid South Africa? I think these are useful tactics, but we should re recognize that there's a pretty striking difference between the current, uh, what's called by the participants the BDS movement, and uh, the resort to these tactics in the case of South Africa. There was no BDS movement in the case of South Africa. Rather, there was often quite careful use of these tactics when they were appropriate. And it was selective and thoughtful. The sports boycott was important. It was against racial uh, exclusion in the sports teams. And a lot of it was carefully designed for you know, everything wasn't perfect, but the reason it was successful was that there were several conditions that were understood by the participants. Uh, one of them is that first, you have to have a long educational program so that people understand what you're doing. Uh, BDS type tactics uh, began seriously around, pretty much around maybe the late 70s. Now, that was after decades of uh, educational work, organization. Uh, by then, apartheid was uh, you know, practically it was condemned by just about everyone, uh, even corporations. In fact, the Congress was beginning to pass sanctions. In fact, Reagan, who was an incredible racist, had to, uh, uh, he had to evade congressional sanctions. He tried to veto them, but they were passed over his veto, and then he had to evade them to keep supporting uh, South Africa for interesting reasons. That was part of his war on terror. Uh, remember that uh, the war on terror began in 1981, not 2001, and uh, it was the focus of U.S. foreign policy. And uh, the ANC, the African National Congress, was uh, designated as, quoting, one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. That was 1988, uh, right near the end of apartheid. Uh, Nelson Mandela himself just got off the terrorist list a couple of years ago. He can now come to the United States without uh, special dispensation. So you had to defend white South Africans from terrorism. That sounds familiar today. Uh, but uh, he had lost the public on that. I mean, the public had turned against it. They were ready for stronger actions. Notice that we're nowhere near that in the case of Israel today, not even close. Uh, secondly, the use of these tactics in the best cases, and a lot of them were good, uh, paid attention to two crucial questions. Uh, d what's their impact on the society that we're sanctioning? Like, do they uh, pr uh, uh, produce a cost for the society? Okay, well, that's important. Uh, and secondly, what's their, uh, how do they appeal to the audience that we're trying to reach? The audience we're trying to reach is people here. Uh, these efforts are, as in the case of South Africa, are, an eff are part of the educational program of getting people to recognize we've got to do something to bring these crimes to an end. So you have to ask yourself, well, are the tactics well adapted to that? Or do they have the opposite effect? I mean, are they so remote from the understanding of the people you're trying to reach that they alienate them and they become uh, uh, more supportive of the crimes? Uh, uh, activist movements and nationalist movements have always understood this. So, for example, I can remember uh, the long discussions with the Vietnamese back in the 1960s about what were the right tactics to use. And they were strongly opposed to a lot of the tactics that were used by the young people who were deeply committed to ending the war, like uh, the weathermen, you know, who marched down the street and break, uh, break bank windows and so on. Uh, they thought that was just totally crazy because they understood that it harms them. It just builds up support for the war. Uh, 
uh, what they wanted is, uh, I was telling Mariam before, one of the main, I remember when they suggested as a tactic, this is a period of real militancy in the United States, they suggested, they said what they really liked was when a group of women in the United States uh, went to the graves of American soldiers and stood silently. They thought that was a great tactic. Well, you know, that didn't much appeal to the kids who for good reasons were pretty upset by the war and wanted to do something more militant. But if you care about the victims, that's the kind of question you ask. Uh, and uh, it was done pretty well, I think, you know, not perfectly in the South African movement. And those are the considerations that have to be thought through. But there was never a BDS movement with uh, principles, you know, that you had to adhere to and so on. And never. And that was wise, I think. So they're good tactics. They can be used effectively, but you have to think about them. You have to think about all the aspects of them. There's one last question up there. Number four hasn't had any uh, share. Whoever's got the microphone. <laughs> we'll give, we'll give you a bonus. OK. I have recently become acquainted with the global commons movement that promotes trusteeship and stewardship instead of ownership of land. Currently, we live in a system that protects the ownership of land. Okay, oops. Do you think that land ownership in its current form, which hemorrhages the land's produce and resources, profits, into the pockets of the landowner, plays a part in our current wars? I mean, what you describe is almost by definition something we should obviously be opposed to, but uh, you know, it's, it's not really a large part of the current wars. I mean, a lot of this, incidentally, is being carried out by countries like Saudi Arabia and others who are buying up big pieces of Africa and uh, they're not the only ones to try to convert, uh, convert it to agricultural production, which they need. Uh, they're doing a lot of purchase of land, but that's not, it's not right, but it's not contributing to war. Uh, the uh, Western countries are uh, not really, tr you know, like when they invade Iraq or Afghanistan, are not trying to buy up the land. Um, they have all kind of you know, strategic and economic reasons, but uh, not to buy the land. It's a, it's a bad thing you know, here in our own countries, too, and it should be dealt with, but I think you know, without misrepresenting the kind of context in which it takes place. Thank you very much. I'm going to just end with a housekeeping note. If you're interested in uh, buying some signed copies of uh, Professor Shomsky's book, please come out this way. If you're fed up with us and want to leave as fast as possible, go through the back. And finally, I want to thank you all for your support and thank you, Professor Tom. Number of people, including people, you know, such luminaries as Bernard Henri Lévy and and so on, to um, pick a, a short list of 65 on which you do not appear. And I was wondering whether you had any comments on that. I didn't have any comments when the first one appeared because it's a joke, and don't have any comments on the later ones. Although there were some interesting reactions to the first one. Uh, one of the main columnists for the Financial Times, uh, Gideon Rachman, I think his name is, uh, wrote a blog in which he said, we have to organize people. 
to make sure to prevent me from getting on the list next time. <laughs> I thought that was amusing, but uh, if there's any other interest in it, I don't know what it is, it's a joke. Uh, as far as Syria is concerned, I mean, it's a tragedy. The country's mo moving towards some sort of suicide. Uh, as to what we ought to do, I, I think you ought to turn around and ask him. Uh, I'd suggest reading Patrick Coburn's column in uh, The Independent yesterday. I think that's about right. Uh, arming the factions is just going to make it worse. Uh, every as far as I know, almost just about everyone who knows they're bothering you. Or do you think that uh, when mosquitoes are carrying malaria, uh, we ought to develop uh, uh, means to kill them off? Well, question. OK, that's part of the answer. You can pursue. Sure, animals should have rights. But uh, none of us believe that animal, including Peter Singer, that. Uh, animals should have the rights of human beings. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, rights don't exist in a vacuum if you're talking about moral philosophy. Uh, rights are associated with responsibilities. Uh, we don't attribute any responsibilities at all to other uh, uh, animals, do we? I mean, we don't say that a, a lion has to be sent to the gas chamber if it kills a gazelle, let's say. No, they don't have responsibilities. And that, of course, if in moral philosophy, now just abstract discussion, uh, relates to the question of what their rights are. And uh, you can, I mean, they should have rights. So for example, it's a step forward in our general uh, kind of moral development that uh, uh, animals are not uh, subjected to uh, torture in the way Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. What we're going to do is we'll go around this way. Um, we have microphones all over the, um, the hall. Uh, I can't actually see everything, but um, let's start this way if you would like to. Yes, go on. Hello, Professor Chomsky. I am perturbed by two questions of moral philosophy. The first one is concerning Peter Singer. Is he right on animal rights? And my second question is on inequities at birth. We can't redistribute IQ, height, good looks, talent. We can redistribute wealth and income. Does this have any moral significance at all? Thank you. Um, just out of, um, this? I think. Oh. Well, just out of curiosity, uh, uh, do you kill insects? Like mosquitoes, Wendy's and capacities. I think you mentioned IQ. That's one of the least significant of them. I mean, whatever it is, it's some very marginal phenomenon. But, uh, it's, uh, OK, anyone on that side? Uh, but there are real ones, and I think it's great. Sure, there should be a very complex world in which people can do different things, and we can admire and enjoy what they do. Okay. Do you want to go here since there's no one there? Or... Thank you. Um, Professor Chomsky, this is um, Amesh Amiaza from Ceasefire magazine. Uh, we did an interview with you in the spring of 2011 as the uh, revolutions were sweeping the Arab world. And at the time, um, when I asked you about Syria, the picture was not very clear. And I was wondering, two years now down the line, what your thoughts were on the situation there. And if I could be allowed a second minor question. Prospect Magazine um, runs a poll of the greatest intellectual in the world. And for the first two polls, I think I'm sure you're familiar with, 10 years ago and five years ago, you were either the top uh, intellectual or uh, number two, I think, based on popular votes. This year, they've asked... No they were just a few years ago. So in Britain and the United States, there are now constraints on uh, the torture, what we call experiment, torture of uh, uh, at least animals that are closer to us, like primates. 
uh, than there were 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, so yes, we're developing some sort of conception of uh, rights, but I don't think anyone thinks that animals have the rights and responsibilities of human beings. Uh, okay, then we can enter into the details. Uh, what was the second question? What was the second question? Oh yeah, about IQ. No, not uh, about, about general gifts that we are born with. Okay, I mean like, you know, the, somebody asked me to, before to sign uh, a picture and told me that she had only once before asked someone to sign a picture, some tennis champion. Okay, well, I'm never gonna be a tennis champion, so uh, good. I'm, I'm not sorry that he has those talents which I don't have. I mean, I'm not sorry that uh, people can play the violin in ways I can't dream of or, and so on. I think that's great, otherwise it'd be an extremely boring world. So yes, people have all sorts of uh, quali 